called Leviticus. It was called, and he called. And to me, it, it touched me when I realized that, when I learned this truth, because Jesus, when he says, I will build my church, is using this, like a similar word in the Greek language, that the word ecclesia, I will build my ecclesia, that is calling out of. So he's using the same terms and to speak to, uh, uh, to, to you uh, as uh, here God in the Old Testament was talking to his people and he called. Do you feel called this morning? Yeah. Hallelujah. You are really called. You are loved. You are called and God wants you to be close to him. Why is Leviticus important to you? He says, oh, this is the one book that I am not sure that I really like. Most people today are put off by Leviticus because there's a lot of blood, a lot of sacrifice. It's so gloomy and uh, uh, lots of rules and regulations about everything, what to eat, what not to eat, pure and pure and all of this, so a lot. But did you know that in the Hebrews customs, Leviticus is the first book that they train their children with? I didn't know that. And you say, wow, this is so unusual. Because you look at Leviticus, it says, oh, this is for seminary graduate. This is for theology. And the content of this book is so complex. But the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, started the education, the Christian education of their children with this book. That should tell us something. Amen? Say amen a little bit louder. Amen. Yes? Amen. OK, praise God. Let's see what some theologians are saying about this book. Let's click all of them. Mr. Kellogg, uh, Dr. Kellogg, says this is the greatest book in the Bible. Mr. Doodley, Dr. Doodley, says the most important book in the Bible. And Dr. Parker, I like what he says, considered as embracing the history of one month only, this may claim to be the most remarkable book in the Old Testament. Wow, this is so wonderful that these great theologians have learned that in their studies of the Word of God. Let's look at the timeline of the, the book where it is situated, looking at a map. We see that uh, Leviticus is actually the exact continuation of Exodus. There is no separation, there's no time frame separated. Exodus finished, Leviticus begins right there, and numbers continue. So there is no stopping. So we know where they are. Uh, yes, okay. They are there. <laughs> they were there. So they, we just arrived now. Okay, so we were at the map, the Mount Sinai, they have come at the Mount Sinai, and God gave Moses the law, the, tw the Ten Commandments, and a lot of moral and social laws. And the, later on, you know the story in Exodus, Moses received the, the blueprint of the tabernacles here, where God is planning to go and dwell among, in the midst of all the tribes of Israel. Look at all these myriads of people. They are in exact order by tribes camped around uh, surrounding God. And God wants to be in the middle and you have the column of, uh, of clouds and, uh, and fire to, to be there. But when God gave his people the law, they were away. God says, don't come near me because you will be consumed. It was like a fearsome experience. They were afraid of God. But God now seems to have another approach to them. says, I want to live in the midst of you. I want, this is a very important time in history. If you look at the next slide and you can click all of them. At the end of the last chapter of Exodus, we read that the cloud covered the tent of the meeting and the glory of the Lord filled. They finished the tabernacle and God filled it with his glory and they could not even enter and they click, click, click. Okay, give me all. And then the, the last, uh, about the last verse of the book is that the tabernacle was set up, and look at the dates of these two scriptures, on the first day of the first month of the second year after they left Egypt. So they had already been two years uh, over there, so times passed. But in the first day of the first month of the second year, the temple was finished, and the glory of God came, and God filled the temple. And now, in Numbers chapter 1, verse 1, starts with on the first day of the second month. So you have the first month and the second month. Within one month, you have the book of Leviticus right in the middle. This wonderful book 
that is a history changing book. Because from Exodus, where the people were afraid of God, and God always realized this, God always kept a distance because of His holiness. And the people are sinful. We are sinful. So how can sinful man approach a holy God? It's impossible. But here God says, go back to the map. Show me the map, the wonderful map. Then the map. We see that God has decided, I want to be with my people. But there is a very important symbolism here. God is in the middle. There's a holy place, the most holy place. But if you see, maybe it's a little bit map, uh, small when you only focus here, but you see a wall all around. A wall higher than the highest of us here today. So that you, that is symbolizing, this is holy, I'm here in the midst of you, but you cannot just come to me like this. So the book of Leviticus is the instructions during this one month that God is going to train his people and another thing to do to keep in mind this morning the people at that time had a very little knowledge of the attributes of God of who God was they had been 400 years and slave in Egypt without a, a system of priesthood this is new now, we, we know it because we are looking back we have the Bible but to them, they didn't have that. They had never been instructed. When Moses and Aaron came to the Jewish people to set them free, Mo Moses says, how will they believe me? Uh, who will I tell them that is sending me? They don't know you, they don't know me. So they didn't have a lot of knowledge from, from God at that time. So the book of Leviticus is going to change all of this. I'm going to teach you how to approach me, the Holy God. And then the, the, the priesthood, the Leviticus, the context, has, has been teaching all of these people, you want to come near the holy God, here is how you are going to come. So that is the, the background of the book of Leviticus as we, we have it now. To guide the sinful, yet redeemed people and their relationship with the holy God. They have been redeemed out of the slavery and now they were walking to the promised land, but they had to be trained. They had to know God. They had to know God in depth, because otherwise they will be killed by His holiness. They have to come near. And another thing that you, you need to, to discover this morning, if we want to summarize the theme of this book, number one, with one word, it's the word holiness. I think you guessed it right already. God is holy okay I realized this morning that the word holy doesn't get many people excited oh holy so exciting oh. yeah because you know it, it is tragic in a way because the world today has a weird notion about uh, the most wonderful word this is the most wonderful word can you say that together the most wonderful word why because holy means perfect hey come on this is not a negative word this is a beautiful word actually there are books written the beauty of holiness you want beauty it's holy it's pure it's separated it's not stained it's not dirty it's not evil, it's not dark, it's not depressed, it's not sick, it doesn't have blemish. What do you want best of that? The purest diamond without blemish, we could see, is reflecting some notions of what holiness is. You would see a, a nice diamond, the, the, the most expensive diamonds in the world, and you say, oh, this is good, I want that, okay? But why, why about, what about holiness? Do you want that? Holiness is much more valuable than the most expensive diamonds in the old world. You understand that? So this world today has, has tarnished, perverted, the most beautiful word. To, to many of us, holiness means 
stern, uh, away, angry, not attainable, uh, punishing, like some kind of things like that. But this is not what God wants to train his people. It lose, listen, he's already proven. I want to be there with you. I want to bless you. My presence wants to be with you. That's not something that is negative. To this you can say amen. amen. Oh, not many of you. Maybe you were daydreaming, thinking about your lunch. But you should, you should pay attention to the words that I see this morning. Don't think about your lunch, okay? Wait, be patient, hallelujah. The theme we will focus on this morning is the way to God through sacrifice and what sin does to destroy that wonderful relationship that God wants uh, together. So this morning, let us rediscover some of the meaning of holiness. The separateness, the absolute uniqueness, the beauty, and also learn how sin devastates humanity's relationship with their creator. There is an emphasis in the book of Leviticus on the need for you and for me for personal holiness. So that is very clear in this book. You and I who worship God, the worshipers of God, we have a need for personal holiness if we want to come near a holy God. Sin must be dealt with God's way because that's the only way that sin can be dealt with. So the theme of the first sections of Leviticus is found in chapter 1 to chapter 7. You will find uh, personal nearness, how to come to God. And this morning we will not go very far because we are going to introduce many concepts of, of the books. How can I, how can you approach God? Me, an imperfect human being, approach a perfect, infinite supreme being like God. How can I approach like this? And we will find five types of offerings that uh, the book of Leviticus in the seven first chapters emphasize. The burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the uninten unintentional sin offering, and trespass offering sins. And all of these have specific meanings and application to all of us in our lives and we will see that in the weeks, in the weeks ahead. Let's begin with uh, the burnt offering. This is the kind of offering that God wants first on the line. Let's read the text. If his offering is a burnt offering, he shall offer a male without blemish he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. Okay, just, let's stop there. Just pay attention to all the process and all the details. And it is not even complete. As you can see, there's a lot of little dots there. That means that I haven't put all the text and all the chapters. But there's so many details. The list, God has a way, a unique way. And he's very strict about this. But pay attention to the whole process. And at the same time, to make it a bit more relevant, to imagine you. This is you bringing this offering to God in this context. Imagine uh, this is. This is the kind of worship that God prescribed for the people to approach God. God hasn't changed today. God never changed. So God is looking for a worshiper. And here it says, his offering is a burnt offering, he shall. If you bring an offering. And two words that I want you to associate together this morning. We're offering and worshiper. Because when you worship, you offer to God something. When you offer to God something, an offering, you worship the Lord. So these two words should be have the same meaning to us this morning. So these people are saying to God, through the burnt offering, I am going to you. I want you. Lord, I, I have sin in my life. But I want to come near you, your way. I obey your instructions because I want to have fellowship with you. Lord, have mercy on me or something like this. So that's why this text says, He shall offer a male without blemish, an animal, 
He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. So that's an association, a, a commitment, an action. It, and look at from God's point of view. And it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Atonement is another word that we will uh, study in a, word, in a while. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord. Pastor Jennifer last week mentioned it and I, I, I never really realized it before. I always thought it was the, the, the priest killing. But actually it's the worshiper killing, putting to death. That is new to me. I haven't really observed that even though I've read the Bible over and over many, many times. You, yourself, you bring your offering, you kill it. How would you like that, Flora? Have you ever killed an animal? No. Have you ever skinned an animal? I remember in the old days in Canada, I trapped animals in the winter, some rabbits, and the snow under the, the evergreen trees. And the first time I skinned my first animals, I didn't like that. I really didn't, but I did it because I had to do it. But anyway, that's another thing. So just think about yourself. You are this worshiper. You live in this time. This is how you're going to go to God. You are killing the animals. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood. Just the thought of seeing the blood. How many of you would faint if you would see blood? Like a lot of blood, like a, an accident, a bloody accident. Maybe, oh, look at, us, look at that. My wife always do that. Every time there's sh sh shooting in the, in the TV, she just says, oh, I'm not looking. Tell me when it's over. <laughs> that, that, that's really, that, that's, that's how she is. She doesn't want to, to see it. Okay. So this is bringing, and look at the last expression. This is an aroma pleasing to the Lord. The Lord says, you want me? You believe in me? You obey me? You offer me what I request of you uh, uh, without blemish animals? You have you know, killed it? You are offering it to me? Oh, this is pleasing to me. You know, there are five sacrifices. Okay, look, go back to the five sacrifice charts. So I want to make a point there. These three here are voluntary sacrifice. They are not requested, these three. And we will talk about these two next time, but today we're looking at this one. These are voluntary. These two are not voluntary. You have to, because you have sin. You, you need, these are s about sin. These ones are voluntary, these three. And these three have this expression, it's a good aroma, sweet aroma to the Lord, because it comes from you. You want the Lord, it is sweet aroma, and you offer it completely, it's completely burned to the Lord. It's a total commitment. You are worshiping the Lord. You are going to the Lord. You want the Lord in your, in your, in your life. So that is very important. Let's go back to the, the scripture. Look at the process. We have here the problem to universal man to universal mankind. How can sinful men approach a holy God? Sin is the great separator. Sin is the virus that infect the whole of human race, regardless of where you're coming back, coming from. Uh, if you are from the Philippines, your sin has infected you. If you come from America or Africa, your sin has affected you. It doesn't matter where you are from. You are a woman, your sin has infected you. If you are a man or a child, young or old, rich or poor, sin, this is one thing we all have in common. All have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Keep in mind that this is, you can imagine, you see that the picture, the picture, when I ask a flora, would you kill? This is a very visual worship system. This is very visual. You don't offer to God something privately hidden in your, in your room with this system. You take the animals from your flock, you bring your animals in front of everybody else. Come follow me. And then you kill it, everybody sees it, you have to wait your turn. If there is 100 people in front of you, you have to wait. You are the 99, 
you know, I don't know how long it takes to do this sacrifice. I have no idea. How many of you have ever lived by or visited a slaughterhouse? Yeah, I lived not far from a slaughterhouse in one of the small village before. The screaming, yee <laughs> wow, it's not good. The smell, the blood, the actions, what's happening, the trash after, the, the whatever they, they're not selling to you, they are doing something else with it. It's not nice. It's not enjoyable. So try to imagine this very visual, graphic picture every day from morning to night, non-stop. That's what sin requires. This is showing us something. Sin, that's what it makes. God wants to forgive your sin, but in order to forgive your sin, this is what is necessary. That's the message of God. I want you to approach me my way, because that's the only way. And God is talking to us this morning. You know, we have the world saying to us, all religions are the same. All roads lead to God. This is called relativism. Doesn't matter, it's all the same. You, me, my concept, your concept. Do what you want about God, I'll do what I want. But the Bible teaches us the opposite. It teaches us exclusivism. There's no many ways. There's one way, this is God's way. There's only a certain way when someone can approach God. And according to Leviticus, it's by the shedding of blood. That's why in this book you will see lots of blood. Fountains of blood. You, you, you prefer a fountain of chocolate? Fondue chocolate, but this is a fountain of blood. God takes His holiness very, very seriously. And you should also. The trend in our postmodern society, and even in churches and modern churches, is to listen to that. This is, you, you will recognize maybe yourself or the, the mentality of our time. The, the trend is to create God to create a God in our own image, giving Him the attributes that we would like Him to have instead of the attributes that the Word of God says that He has. Do you understand what I'm saying? I will repeat it. We create in our generation a God according to our own concept, our own likings, our own imagination, our own ideas, our own likings. I want my God to be like this. I want my God to be a loving, like a God of convenience, uh, uh, you know. So we give God the attributes that we want Him to have, that we wish He would have for our well-being. Not to make us feel bad, make us feel comfortable, enjoy life, and not have any, any trouble, instead of the, the attributes that He, God Himself, says or declares in the Word, this is who I am. If you remember the title slide, be holy because I, the Lord, am holy. That's what God says. But in this generation, we have changed that and we have made an image of our own God. Let me share some expression with you. God, absolute holiness. God's supreme splendor. God, unapproachable light. We read this terminology in the Bible. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, is unapproachable light. This, this, these concepts are foreign to many Christians. We don't even know it is in the Bible, and we don't think of God in this way. But this is what God says that He is. The way to God is by sacrifice. The language found in the book of Leviticus is very strange to our modern ears. This is not uh, commonly spoken on the street. This is not how we speak, and you understand that. Huh? Uh, go to the next uh, verse, Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. 
the life is in the blood. When you give your blood completely, you give your life as a price, as a ransom, as a payment. This is called atonement. Two times we see atonement in that one verse. Atonement comes 45 times in the book of Leviticus. So that is 27 chapters. This is a short book. Many chapters are very short. This is not a huge, huge book to read. It's very fast to read through. But atonement is 45 times you will find. So it's very important. What does that mean? Atonement means to cover up. So the blood of bulls and goats did not actually take away sin. It covered it up for a time until the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, will come to take away once and for all the sin. We will see these scriptures in a moment. But for now, the atonement was, you, you want to come near me? Okay, I will atone for your sin. I will cover your sin. I am accepting you in my presence. You can worship me. I accept your sacrifice. And if we would, you, if all of us Christians would pay more attention to the principle of Leviticus, it would change our worship. It would change our way to come to church every Sunday. And you understand that. I think it has a deep, a deep, deep impact. So atonement. Another word that is so many times repeated is the word blood. 88 times. The word blood is mentioned in Leviticus. It's a bloody book. It's full of blood. It's full of blood. And it shows the awfulness of sin and why. What sin does. What sin requires. What your sinfulness requires of God. Because God wants you. You see, one thing that you, I, I want to repeat it and I want it to be one of the main messages of this morning. Even though God says holy, holy, he is holy of holiness, he wants more than anything else to be approached. God is not, like many times we say, holy, he, wa he doesn't want me. He's, he's away. He's, he's not interested. He's, he's too far distant. That's not, that's not. He has moved in the tabernacle. He wants, and he gives us a method to come to him. So if God would, wouldn't want to be approached, he would not give us all of these instructions. That's a proof that God wants you and me to come near him. God wants, wish, desire to be approached by you, but on its own term. Not just like the world would approach, would approach him. So that's why there's so much blood in this book. The first seven chapters shows us how to cure the universal infection it is by only one way the shedding of blood that's why there is so so much blood and if you look at the next scriptures hebrew chapter 9 indeed under the law and pay, pay attention here you read this text it's from hebrew but the language used there it's the language of leviticus indeed under the law almost everything is purified with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin. That is very clear. This is New Testament. But you, when you read it, you think you're reading Leviticus. It supports the same doctrine. Your doctrines as Christians in the New Testament find their foundations in the Old Testament. And the book of Leviticus is the center of the doctrines of salvation, of the doctrines of worship, of the doctrines of how to approach a holy God. You find all of these, the foundation of everything is right there in the book of Leviticus. So my first question is, why is Leviticus important? You have a partial answer right there. In all the regulations, another thing that you will learn to appreciate is there. It, you will see in all the bloods and all the regulations for sacrifice so that you can come to God. You will find the graciousness of God, the grace of God. Even though you have sinned, he still wants you and he wants to remove your sin. So he come up with the plan. This is the method that he will use so that you can come to him. This is called grace. You don't, you don't deserve it. You have sinned. You should have something for your sin. Instead, he prepared for you a way 
so that your sin will be atoned for blood, more blood and more blood. Blood, blood, blood to take you to, to him. Another word that is very important, of, of course, you, you know it, I've mentioned it so many times, is the word holy. It's mentioned 88 times in the book of Leviticus. Be holy, holiness. But here we have a problem. How was God going to explain his holiness to an uneducated people? A people that doesn't understand what holiness is about. You know, holiness is like a, an abstract concept. How do you, okay, how would you explain holiness to a three-year-old child? That's a pretty big challenge to do that. There's probably one method that you will want to use to try this. It is through pictures. Pictures is worth uh, 1,000 words. So you will find a picture that would, when you, when you start to teach the ABC, you use pictures. T, tiger, ah, picture of tiger, T, okay, P, papa, okay, a father or something uh, in French. Uh, banana, B for banana, yeah, and, and then you use these uh, uh, pictures so that the child has a memory as something he has learned, B, banana association, and then he gets the concept. In the Bible, God did the same, same method. Let me teach you some, some words that probably some of you have read it in the Bible without maybe paying a lot of attention. The first word that's very important, especially if you are new Christians, you need to get this. Foreshadowing. Foreshadow. A shadow of something real that is to come later. But we have a shadow, we have a picture of something that is real, but not yet. But you have a picture of it. A prefiguration, of, uh, pre in advance, a figure or a picture of something, you see it in advance so that you will see the reality later. We call it also in the Bible, in the New Testament, a type. Uh, we call it in Chinese, you see, yu xiang or yu biao, like a type, an advance, a type that represents something else that the future will, will be revealing. So we have that in, in the Bible. For instance, in Roman, we see that we talk about the first Adam and the second Adam. Jesus is a type of the second Adam in comparison to Adam that was the first one. The first Adam sin, the second Adam save us from sin. This is a type. Uh, you know, we, we have these kind of things. I remember when I was a new Christian in, in the Bible, uh, like now I use uh, mainly uh, media Bible, okay, like many of you do, but I realize we are missing something when we do that, and I will explain. When I was a young Christian, what really got me interested in the Bible is, oh, I have a picture of my wife in my Bible. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's what we call the cross-reference, the little numbers here. Oh, she's falling. No. <laughs> okay, that's not her. That's just a paper. Okay. And uh, these little numbers, you read a verse, you have a little number in the verse, you look at the cross-reference, and it refers you, it sends you to see a, a link, a, a, a common thread somewhere else in the Bible. And I remember my first cross-reference that got me really interested. It is found in the Gospel of John, when it says, in, as Moses lifted the serpent, the Son of Man, when he will be lifted up, he will draw all men. He will bring people to himself. So it says, as the serpent was lifted, what is it about? So you look at the little cross reference, then it brings you to the story when this took place with Moses. At that time, the people had sinned. They were, God was punishing them, and they had poisonous snakes. You know that story. Poisonous snakes were beating them, and they would die by 20,000. That was a plague for them. So Moses interceded for the people. People cried out to God. And Moses told, uh, God told Moses, build a brazen snake, put it on a pole, 
And when people will look at the pole, even though these snakes are still real, and they will not die, they will be saved. But they must look there. They must put their faith there. They must believe in this. They must obey to that. So that's, then it says, in the same way, when the Son of Man will be lifted up on the cross, will be saved. And that is, I remember that. That was my first discovery of cross-reference use. And I really like that. So I started to read the Bible almost day and night. And it's, it's the equivalent of going to Google today. You click on a link. You find this page. In that page, you have many, many other links that you click, click, click. It leads you to other pages. Then you click, click, click. It leads you to other pages. And an hour later, you're still clicking. <laughs> starting from one, then you have visited like maybe 50 other pages, and uh, you're still doing it. So cross-reference in your Bible does that. The book of Leviticus is like this. It's the, the greatest cross-reference or the greatest foundational doctrinal book about your salvation, the role of Jesus Christ, who he is, and what he has done for the, the salvation. Let's look at the next verse, Hebrew chapter 10, verse 1. You will see an example of that. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. It's a shadow of the good things to come. Again, which book are we talking about? Hebrew. What are we talking about? Leviticus, the laws, the Old Testament. Okay, so we find in Hebrews a cross-reference looking back at that. The doctrines is in the Hebrew, but the foundation of the doctrines is in Leviticus. Without Leviticus, you would not have understood the salvation of Jesus, the concept of the Lamb of God, the concept of His offering, the shedding of His blood. You would not have. You needed that. That's why God had to progressively reveal Himself and reveal his, his way, His holiness, by pictures so that the education of His people would come to the supreme reality that is in Christ Jesus. Otherwise, how would I know? How would I understand the meaning of Jesus Christ's death for my sin? without this book. We don't realize it, but it's all there in Leviticus. Remove this book of the Bibles and Jesus Christ is like, who, what, what, why? Why is he dead? I don't know. What does it have to do with me? I don't know. I'm, uh, who am I? I don't know. But from Leviticus, I know how to approach God. I'm a sinful man. How can I approach a, a holy God, a perfect God? Now I understand what Jesus has done. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 17, you will find the same truth. For these rules are only shadows. You see the book of Leviticus, many people say, it's full of rules, it's boring, it's too long. For all these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Now I get the point of Leviticus. These rituals, these offerings, these law, prefigure point two they are a type in advance of what the person and the work of Jesus Christ would do so before you study Leviticus or when you do make sure you have Hebrew with you the book of Hebrew Roman chapter 3 also you can you can have Colossians Galatians you will have a lot of connections and between that to help you understand. Let's go to the next uh, series of scriptures. These will all be from chapter 10 of Hebrews. That is very important. Verse 4. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Oh, wait a minute. I thought this is the system that God created. And now it says it is impossible. The truth in this is that the blood of bulls and goats can only, in the Old Testament, temporarily atone for, cover up, until the time when the perfect, once and for all, sacrifice of Jesus Christ and His shed blood will come and complete this picture, make it real, and remove our sins. 
so far that as far as the east is from the west, your sins will be. God loves you so much. You can imagine this is a plan. No man can come up with something like that. No man that has a plan from generation that will cover thousands of years to lead you today to understand the riches of the grace of God. His holiness, the beauty. That's why the more you think in this way, the more you start to think, yes, that's true. Holiness is really beautiful. It's beauty of, of holiness. Verse 10, and by that will, the will of God, the plan of God, the system that he came up with, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And Leviticus, every day, every month, every week, every year, they have to repeat sacrifice. They were always under convictions of their own sinfulness. They were never really delivered or free completely. They had to repeat the sacrifices every, from morning to night, every single year, every day of the year. With Christ, you read once and for all, the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, by a single offering, by a single offering in comparison to what we were reading previously, by the same sacrifice that are continually offered every year. That's Leviticus. Here we read, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time. It's complete. It is done. Okay? God wants you near him. Verse 18, where there is forgiveness of these, of all these sinful and problem with sin, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, the conclusion, and it's the message of Leviticus, and the heart of God that is expressed, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, go back to the map. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. The holy God, the myriads of sinful people, through Jesus Christ, we have full access. We can go boldly, we can go with confidence, there is no more limitation. We don't need this. We don't need the, the altar. We don't need the shedding of blood. We don't need to repeat it. It is done once and for all. This system has been, in a way, eliminated, replaced by another, better, the, the new covenant, the better covenant, <laughs> the better high priest, the better sacrifice. It's all better because it's once and for all to sanctify you and you can enter into the holy presence of God by the blood of Jesus. That is wonderful. So why is the book of Leviticus important? Because it teaches us that truth, that God wants you to be with him. In a much better way, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was the substitute for our sins. An atonement for our sin has been made through his shed blood. Now, you and I, we can stand before the holy God without fear, without hesitation without doubts because when Jesus sees you when God sees you he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ you believe in Jesus the 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 substitution has been done the laying of hands has been done the shedding of blood has been completed once and for all you are free you are set free when Jesus came to offer himself as the ultimate sacrifice holy and perfect once and for all, he has fulfilled the law and the sacrifice, animal sacrifice, were not necessary anymore for you. That's wonderful. So Flora doesn't have to kill an animal anymore. So she can enjoy entering into the presence of God and really appreciate the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know, after a while, you've been Christian for so many years, we, we forget to appreciate the, 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 the love of God. In conclusion, the walk with God. You want to walk with God, because now God, we, we understand the system. He has saved us. But now, what next? I'm saved now, what's next? I have access to God, what's next? I live with God, and the other sacrifice will show us service, will show us fellowship, 
we will move on with, with God. But for now, let's read Leviticus 20, 26 and 1 Peter 1, 15, 16. You shall be holy for me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. And this concept of holiness is for the New Testament. If you go to the next scriptures, you will see the next scripture says the same. It says Peter saying us, and it, the quote is directly from Leviticus. So the New Testament really find its, its truth and the foundation over there. So in closing, Brother Stephen is going to prepare for, for a closing song. How, listen up, how can you and me live holy lives when the world around us is so unholy? You see, in Leviticus, God arranged a time out, one month. Whoa, stop, I have some, something to, to train you, to, to help you to understand something. And this is a very important time out. A detailed preparation for living holy. How to live holy, how to worship in a culture that doesn't have any idea what holy is. That's what he did for them. This is what the scriptures does for us today. Do you think the world today understands the concept of holiness? Hello? No, huh? Holy is the word, Brother Stephen, holy is the word that sets God apart and also prevent us from creating a God in our own imagination, a God of, of convenience. Holy, listen up, don't look at Brother Stephen, he's just preparing. Holy means, even though he's very handsome, <laughs> holy means that God is alive on his own terms. You can relate to him and receive his life. Another thing that we learn in holiness is that you cannot use God. God is not a tool. God is not an appliance. And God is not a credit card. You cannot fit God in your plans, but you must fit yourself in his plan. That's what holiness is separated, it's highest, it's, it's the greatest. The Hebrew word for holy is separate, set apart. It describes the otherness of God, his uniqueness, his, his separation, this is so pure, is so separate, unique, so much greater. For you and I to be holy simply means to be dedicated to God. You are holy to the extent that your life is devoted to Him. That's all. It's not very complicated. The concept, if you think about it, God is holy. Jesus has done everything for you. You have access to God. Live with God. Live with God. It means to be dedicated and your actions must reflect His character. Holy means that every detail of our lives is affected by the presence of this holy God in you. And everything you offer to God as a worshiper, say, God, here I am. God, this is what my heart desires to offer to you. Everything that in your life, every aspect of your life that you worship God with, God transform. God makes holy. God sanctifies it and He uses it. Let's rethink the word holy, H-O-L-Y. Let's think of the word holy like W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy, whole, complete, perfect, elevated. Uh, you are complete when you live with God in holiness. Your life is wonderful. Your life is free. There's no evil. There's no darkness. There's no... All of these consequences in your life, you are being elevated. You are being separated. You are uh, reflecting the holiness of God. God transform. The way to happiness is holiness. And parents, remember that. Tell your children the way to happiness is holiness. And closing, think about Jesus. Jesus was living in proximity to his father. But was the life of Jesus like stern? non-attractive, 
was he mean angry uh, you know just let the children come to me the lepers he, he would come and embrace him the sick people he would heal he was holy and he embraced people he called people to come to him so this morning you are called to come to him amen let us stand hallelujah